Hi, welcome you all to the fourth episode of Curiosity the Science program summing up the developments in week number 20, 2020. As usual, this episode features stories across the disciplines. Cycling, social diversity, language evolution, school segregation, microplastics, marsupial, bees, aerobic exercise, Antarctica, COVID-19 vaccine development and so on plus observances in the next week and opportunities for the students and researchers. So keep watching. The first story of the week is about the link between aerobic exercise and memory and cognition. The paper published last week in the journal Alzheimer's Disease. The title of the paper is Brain Perfusion Change in Patients with Mild Cognitive Impairment After 12 Months of Aerobic Exercise and Training. The study included 30 persons for uh, one year and the main conclusion is that the aerobic exercise boosts the blood flow into two key regions of the brain associated with the memory and cognition, hippocampus and anterior cingulate complex. So the study is really interesting and significant, uh, especially in the patients with dementia or Alzheimer's disease. You know, the memory loss is very common, isn't it? And the rest of us too. So if you want to increase your memory power, so aerobic exercise like running or uh, uh, performing one of the exercises which I featured earlier in this channel, that's science scientific seven minute exercise you can consider. This study have shown that the blood flow can help even older people with memory issues to improve their cognition, a finding that the scientists could guide future Alzheimer's disease and dementia research. So the study has got potentials for Alzheimer's as well as dementia research. A quote from the study is that we have shown that even when your memory starts to fade, you can still do something about it by adding aerobic exercise to your lifestyle. So. You know the importance of the aerobic exercise like running and biking is highlighted in this study so, so it's yet another reason to run and bike coming to bike our second story is about biking the cycling the second story of the week is about the commute mode and uh, a number of diseases you know there's a study entitled associations between commute mode and cardiovascular disease cancer and all cause mortality and cancer incidence using linked census data over 25 years in england and wales a cohort study was published in uh, you know the, the british journal called lancet last week and study included so many people the adults included were 784000 adults so it's almost 7 last 7.8 lakh adults so it's a big study and what they found and the study went on for 25 years so it's a very uh, landmark paper it has made a you know they they made use of tremendous data and the study revealed that the cycling to work can cut the risk of dying early from the illness such as heart disease and cancer by up to 24 percent so that means uh, you know almost a quarter uh, you can reduce the risk of dying premature death by uh, from the cancer and cardiovascular disease if you opt to bike to work just like uh, what I'm doing of course I'm a I'm an avid cyclist and now the study also did the analysis on the walking so walking to work showed a less significant impact than the cycling but walking commuters studied still experienced a seven percentage lower rate of cancer diagnosis than the driver commuter peer. so uh, you know if you are not into cycling you can still walk you know the walk still reduce seven percentage risk so uh, is seven percent is really significant you might think even one percentage is significant friends because cardiovascular and cancer are alarming it's you know a large number of people are dying from it and more than that it's the treatment is very expensive so prevention is better than cure isn't it so the best way to prevent is adopting a carbon neutral lifestyle as well as uh, biking to work so yeah cycling to work is extremely important but you know when i read this story there is a concept in statistics called confounding so the confounding variable might have biased this study that is what my apprehensions are so the article did not mention how they approach the confounding variable uh, and of course i wonder about the potential impact in this study for example are bikers more likely to live a more healthy lifestyle overall for example healthier diet 
less tobacco and so on of course uh, you know uh, these patterns are always same so for example a person if you think that if you just simply ask do you eat a lot of salad every day so if the person say yes so is he or she is not simply eating salad and he or she must be uh, eating salad as past, part of a overall healthy lifestyle so uh, t uh, chances are high that cyclists tend to uh, you know be non-smokers and uh, teetotalers and eat healthy food so overall health benefits are very important so maybe that's a confounding variable of this study in addition instead of uh, taking a car to your workplace if you commute daily you are significantly reducing carbon footprint and you are doing a good favor to the environment you know the carbon uh, neutrality is extremely important because carbon dioxide is a, a greenhouse gas you know it's resulting in the global warming and guess what our third story of the week is about the carbon dioxide the third story of the week is uh, a paper published in a journal called Nature Climate Change last week by an English team. The paper is entitled Temporary Reduction in Daily Global CO2 Emissions During COVID-19 Forced Confinement. We all are confined at our home places, right? Homebound these days. So, uh, of course, we have, uh, you know, one of the positive attributes is a tremendous reduction in the world's uh, pollution level. Of course, CO2 levels as well. News is coming here and there that CO2 levels are coming down. The pollution level is, you know, uh, coming down. And, of course, there are a lot of fake news as well. Like, dolphin is being sighted in Ven Venetian canals. That was a fake news. Or you can see Himalayas from Delhi. Of course, that, that, that is of fake news as well but overall there is a huge reduction in the uh, you know the, the pollution levels at this COVID-19 lockdown but we really don't have any exact figure till date and this is a landmark paper, paper on, on that level so now that we have an exact number so the paper concluded that uh, the cut in the daily carbon dioxide emissions is 17 percentage at the peak of the pandemic shutdown last month so see uh, last month it was up to 17 percentage it came down uh, from the January levels so the biggest global uh, drop was from April 4 to 9 when the world was spewing 18.7 million tons of the carbon pollution a day less than it was on the New Year's Day so um, much lesser see 18.7 million tons less means uh, it's, the impact is really really high isn't it and the papers say that the drop is the biggest drop you know annual drop in carbon dioxide emissions since world war ii see it is a huge impact uh, i hope that this uh, you know the the lockdown really teaches us to adopt a carbon neutral lifestyle and we can continue the spirit uh, uh, towards in the future as well but it all depends on how our governments react here in india or elsewhere in the world so government actions and economic incentives post crisis will likely influence the global co2 emissions path for decades and if you look at the one of the graph in that paper as you can see that this is uh, tremendously increasing from 2000 2010 and 2020 so suddenly there is a huge dip so right now we are almost at the level of 2010 but then again it's it will go up right that is the prediction says so as you can see that the dip is you can see that from april and may so this is just the predicted line because uh, lockdown things are now getting slowly over right so we are going back to the normality so the key is that uh, you know we really have to learn from this crisis and uh, we should actually change our ways we should actually ab adopt a carbon neutral lifestyle and that is the only solution for the climate change crisis of course adopting a carbon neutral and environmentally conscious lifestyle is not just about the uh, you know the co2 levels but also about uh, going zero plastic right the plastic pollution is also a, a very important issue these days so guess what our next story of the week is about microplastics fourth story of the week is about microplastics so one paper published last week in the journal environmental pollution entitled are we underestimating microplastic abundance in the marine environment a comparison of microplastic capture with nets of different mesh size and this is about the marine paper and a related paper is also published last week in the journal called global change biology the title of the paper is food web transfer of plastics to an apex riverine predator it's about the riverine ecosystem so the conclusion of these papers is that the first paper concluded that the microplastic pollution in oceans are vastly underestimated 
particles may even outnumber the zooplankton that underpin the marine life and regulate the global climate. So you see that microplastics outnumber the zooplankton that's a significant uh, you know the result with a huge uh, tremendous impact on the marine ecosystem and plastics are of course known to harm the fertility as these have endocrine disrupting chemicals i have covered this topic earlier to watch my video about endocrine disrupting chemicals in the plastic please have a look in the description section of this video of course there are so many studies have shown that the microplastics in the marine ecosystems uh, you know it goes into other uh, food webs actually it goes all the uh, it actually changes the trophic level you know it jumps from one trophic level to the another and it goes all the way to uh, big mammals you know as well as the marine birds you see and also the antarctic birds you know the penguins so the effect is as i told you it is it, it reduces the fertility because it is uh, uh, you know estrogen analog so uh, the impact is tremendous friends uh, the, the fertility rate of the Antarctic penguins are reducing because of the microplastics the second paper uh, showed that how microplastics have entered the food chain in rivers with birds found to be consuming hundreds of plastics a day via aquatic insects on which they feed and definitely the bird you know the impact on the bird is that the fertility rate will come down so you know the bird population will be shrinking and uh, you know it will it will have a tremendous impact on its conservation as well by the way microplastic is not something exotic or something we use microplastic everyday life one example would be you know polyester uh, cloth see the polyester clothing is nothing but uh, uh, microplastic but not many people are aware of it so the, the polyester if you wear a polyester clothing so that it, it's not made up of microplastics no but if you once you use and uh, you know the, uh, discard it so what is happening is the polyester is nothing but polyester right so it will start degrading and it will produce a microplastic so uh, you know reducing your number of polyester clothes will be a good option for fighting against microplastic pollution in general the fifth story of the week is a paper published in the journal Science by a, a team from ETH Zurich in Switzerland and the title of the paper is Bumblebees damage plant leaves and accelerate flower production when the pollen is scarce and yes this is the picture of the week a beautiful bee nibbling on the leaf uh, you know of a plant uh, what, what is actually this this bee is doing it's really interesting see the when the pollen is hard to come by the bees nibble on the leaves of the plant stimulating the faster flower growth so that is really interesting so the bees will start you know the cracking and making some uh, small small holes and other you know the uh, cuts on the leaves of the plant so of course it will have a stimulating effect on it so some plants bloom up a month earlier this survival strategy could help the bees overcome the habitat loss you know that strategy is very interesting it's just like pruning in the gardening so recently i, I pruned my uh, you know the chili i have a chili plant so it's very interesting uh, it's it's heartbreaking actually such a small chili plant just three inch you know and then you're cutting you know so oh, such a tender leaf you're simply cutting it off it is heartbreaking but you see the next day you can see the small uh, you know the branch branchlets are coming out so it is really interesting the pruning works and guess what it's not just gardeners knows it even the bumblebees knows it in the nature see the bumblebee as a gardener it's an interesting story isn't it well there are so many issues threaten the bumblebees including the climate change disease pesticide and even loss of habitat so it's a big problem bees are indeed the social animals just like us they get infected with virus too just like us you know and very interesting that, um, that of course is as a social animal we find it very difficult right the time uh, these covid 19 lockdown so uh, for example physical distancing uh, you know many people are uh, confined to our home but still they are not really happy with this physical distancing they really want to mingle with other people and we defy the physical distancing that's really dangerous friends and how about the bumblebees or the bees in general as a social animal and when they get infected with virus what are their uh, you know behavioral change do they have a physical distancing like human being yes that's our next story 
Sixth story of the week is a paper published by a team from Iowa State University in the United States in the journal PNAS. The title of the paper is that honey bee virus causes context dependent changes in the host social behavior. Very interesting paper. So honey bees infected with a virus may alter their behavior in the ways that slow the spread of the infection. See, amazing friends. It looks like human beings have to learn, you know, the, the physical distancing from the bees. What the researchers did is that they deliberately infected experimental hives with low levels of a virus, something called Israeli Acute Paralysis Virus, so IAPV, they, they infected deliberately. And each bee in the observation hive was tagged with a tiny barcode, basically it's QR code, allowing a computer algorithm to track the movement and behavior of individual bees within the hive. Very interesting ethology, you know, the last episode covered this ethology, animal behavior, right? So this is about the bee behavior with uh, barcode tag bees uh, and, uh, you know, analyzing it by the computer. Oh, very interesting stuff, friends. So while infected bees seem just as active as the healthy bees, they appear less likely to share food with other bees within the hives via mouth to mouth sharing behavior called trophallaxis. So they learn to avoid trophallaxis. They learn to avoid touching or sharing mouth to mouth. It's something like kissing of the bees. So they know that they are infected and they avoid kissing. It's very interesting finding, isn't it? And what is the consequence of this behavior? That is the reduction in trophallaxis. Of course, the, this change could help to slow the spread of the infection within the hive. So it's just like what, how the physical distancing is helping human beings, you know, during the time of coronavirus. So this is the picture. It's very interesting, isn't it? Uh, the barcode tag bees and uh, the, the scientists are working on this kind of interesting science. So science is always exciting, curiosity driven friends. By the way, how do the bees communicate? You can see that the bees dance, different kinds of dance, isn't it? That is how the bees communicate. And uh, guess what? Our next story of the week is about the human communication. Our seventh story of the week is a publication in the last week's Nature Neuroscience uh, by a team. It's an international team uh, from the UK and Germany and United States. The title of the paper is Primary Auditory Prototype in the Evolution of Arcuate Fasciculus. So the paper is all about when did uh, the human language faculty originated, you know. So this is what they are saying. So they come up with a number 25 million years. So origin of human language pathway in the brain is at least 25 million years old. Very interesting stuff. The brain imaging study and analysis of auditory regions in the brain pathways in humans, apes and monkeys, our close evolutionary relatives. And they discovered a segment in this language pathway in the human brain that interconnects the auditory cortex with frontal lobe regions important for processing speech and language. Well, the study discovered this language link, you know, the segment in other primates as well. That is really interesting finding, remarkable finding, I would say. Although speech and language are unique to human beings, the link via auditory pathway in other primates suggests that evolutionary basis in auditory cognition and vocal communication. You see, that's a very interesting finding. Our eighth story of the week is a paper published last week in the journal Sociology of Education by a team from United States and UK. So the lead author is from University of Cambridge. So the title of the paper is Learning Inequality in School Francophone Africa. School quality and educational achievement of rich and poor children. Yes, it is a sociology paper. So the paper is all about social inequalities in learning. That's a very important topic, but not many people are talking about it. Over Hemming reason the study found is that the poor children are disproportionately clustered in lower quality schools, which often lack even basic resources such as textbook, electricity or toilets. So how the social stratification is interlinked with inequalities in education, that is a very interesting finding friends. Mostly it is in government schools that the kids from poorer family goes here in India too, isn't it? And of course they lack basic resources such as you know electricity and toilets. The case is almost identical here in India too, isn't it? That 
that the, uh, uh, the, the children from poorer families goes to government school which are really in pathetic conditions in most of the country. So that has got ramifications on, uh, you know, the outcome, the learning outcomes of the school kids as well. So majority of these kids will not even complete their school education. So we really need to improve. We have to target uh, that schools, actually, if you really want to improve the social system, you know, social condition of the country. So this study found that the school segregation by wealth is creating unequal learning outcomes. So we should never do this segregation of school based on the wealth. The study found that schools which are in, located in lesser economically privileged uh, areas have got poorer standard school while uh, those schools which are in a better quality areas are uh, you know uh, they have better school so situation is exactly same here in India too we really have to fight for this problem on the basis of these results we suggest that the most countries in the region could improve equity as well as overall performance by raising the floor in school quality Yes, we have to raise the floor in school quality that will result in overall improvement of the nation. Our ninth story of the week is also from social sciences. An article published last week in the journal PINAS by a team from Princeton University in the United States as well as Portuguese counterparts. The title of the paper is As Diversity Increases, People Paradoxically Perceive Social Groups as More Similar very interesting because that as the diversity increases usually people will think that the the group is not really similar right it's dissimilar when it becomes heterogeneous but but the paper found vice versa people living in more diverse areas were more likely to perceive themselves and others as being part of the same local community for example new yorkers regardless of ethnic and cultural differences so people who are living in an area which is which has got lots of uh, different people you know uh, from different ethnic and racial background they perceive that they are more or less similar or you know the group is more or less homogeneous but in fact it is heterogeneous so the key as per my understanding is that we actually have to interfere with uh, people from different cultural assets and cultural backgrounds so that is the only way or only cure for racism well i did my phd abroad from japan and friends one of the biggest advantage if you ever study abroad is that you will come across different cultures so you know you are expanding your world view the Weltang Shang you know of Humboldt you're expanding your world view you know and you are actually respecting other cultures so all these traits of liberty and libertarianism will come to you rather than being extremely conservative that is what you know the in uh, in one sense you might have heard a quote that the best cure for racism is travel people who have never travel are, uh, tend to be a lot more racist and highly conservative and religious so maybe because of the exposure to different people so that is the one reason that so when once you travel or if you do a, a you know a degree abroad study abroad and then you're exposed to different cultures different people and somehow your world view also expands you know and you become a lot more accommodative so i think that is the main reason that the study have this paradoxical conclusion anyway it's a very interesting finding our 10th story of the week is from paleontology another exciting field a paper published last week in the journal nature communications uh, the title of the paper is extinction of eastern sahul megafauna coincides with sustained environmental deterioration you might have seen many of these uh, paleontology themed movies isn't it jurassic park or jurassic world isn't it so the, st the movies portray that human beings were fighting with you know uh, huge dinosaurs like tyrannosaurus rex but the reality is very different friends it, have we coexisted with dinosaurs in one sense you can say yes because chicken is also a kind of a dinosaur because you know in in phylogeny they both are in same clade but in reality, uh, the, the dinosaur proper, no, no way. This paper is the first conclusive evidence that the, the human beings coexisted with something called megafauna. Megafauna is huge animals like this, you know, huge, huge animals. So three ton marsupials and lizards as long as cars in ancient Australia, you see. So when the people first arrived in what is now called Queensland, they would have found land inhabited by massive animals including guana six meters long and kangaroos twice as tall as human being 
you know and the biggest of all mammals was a three ton marsupial called diprodon and the deadliest was the pouched predator called tilacolio and when did this happen almost 40000 to 60000 years back it's not that terribly old you know it's in recent history so uh, this is a quote from the paper our study shares the first reliable glimpse of the giants that roamed in australian tropics between 40000 and 60000 years ago very interesting finding isn't it Let's begin the news by the recap on what is happening in the world of treatment and vaccine the updates from the COVID-19 uh, vaccine and treatment. So the treatment as of now we have got two candidates at the phase 3 clinical trials. One is from the Gilead Sciences called Remdesivir while the second one is from Royvan Sciences called Gemcilumab which is a monoclonal antibody. For the vaccines we have got six candidates which, uh, which is in phase 3 clinical trials. Uh, these are from BioNTech, CanSino, Biologicals, Moderna Therapeutics, Innovio Pharmaceuticals, University of Oxford, Sinovac and BioNTech. You might remember that University of Oxford as well as Moderna Therapeutics we have covered in past episodes of the Curiosity. So what has happened last week is from a news from CanSino, you know, a very interesting, exciting news that they published data from 108 subject clinical trials in which its vaccine generated an immune response in volunteers. So it's a fantastic news. So probably CanSino is going to develop a, a successful vaccine. There's a very high likelihood that this firm is going to develop a, a vaccine in uh, coming days. Another news is from the United States that, you know, this is a survey and the results were published in PLOS One paper. The title of the paper is Perceptions of the Adult U.S. Population Regarding the Novel Coronavirus Outbreak. So the study found that U.S. adults took to scientific organizations like CDC rather than the president to lead the country's response to the coronavirus pandemic. So uh, people in the United States have tremendous faith on the scientists like CDC, you know, rather than the politicians like the president uh, for advices regarding coronavirus disease. Well, how about in India, the case uh, we, we really don't know. And even we really don't know how much of the, you know, the extent of hoax spreading or conspiracy theory. So I made a small attempt. This is called COVID-19 perception survey. And uh, the survey, this is a link to go to that survey. And this link is also provided in the description section of this video. Please have a look and click on it and turn in. As a token of appreciation, you will be getting a free copy of my latest book called Voyage to Antarctica upon submission. So the moment you click submit and you will be getting this book link. So uh, happy reading. And this survey won't take much time. It's just two minute survey. So I encourage every one of you, please take this survey. If you are from India, it's only for the Indian, uh, you know, uh, people residing in India can participate in this survey. Yes, Antarctica comes in news last week as well. You know, the remote sensing reveals the increased frequency of green all algal blooms across Antarctica. You see the Antarctic algal blooms in this ice by the snow algae have tremendously increased uh, and uh, they this study is based upon the remote sensing that is from the satellite data but they also did ground level validation of this remote sensing data. So this this is a very alarming news friends. So the changing uh, you know species distribution is not at all a good news. This is by a team from uh, University of Cambridge and British Antarctic Survey. By the way greenifying Antarctica is not a new news here is a news published in 2017 antarctica is going green with all these mosses schistridum antarcticum right so this is what is happening all because of the climate change so it's time for us to fight against the climate change observances in the coming week 25th may is something called towel day to celebrate you know the the life and legacy of uh, douglas adams so he's one of my favorite author so he's the author of the hitchhiker's guides to the galaxy it's a very funny book friends it's a science fiction or rather a comic like science fiction you know a fantastic uh, book where he keep on saying that towel is very important for intergalactic trips so how the towel is important uh, the towel fan of douglas adams i did mention about this in uh, uh, in my book as well the, the you know the voyage to antarctica i did mention about towel day as well so the towel day is on 25th may the the, the day to celebrate with your towels
26 May is International Day for Paper Airplane. You know, if you have ever watched uh, something called Ig Nobel Prize ceremony, Ig Nobel Prize is something like alternative Nobel Prize. And, uh, you know, the ceremony is uh, full of jovial attitude, the hilarious uh, mentality of the, the serious scientists. So they will be playing around. It's, it's a wonderful scene. You can search in YouTube for a past Ig Nobel uh, ceremony. So you can see that very serious looking scientists uh, making, you know, the paper airplanes and uh, they will be launching among the colleagues. Is, is, is very interesting. So Ig Nobel Prize is that the prize uh, is awarded to such discoveries that makes you laugh at first but makes you think later. So it's very interesting. So just check out the Ig Nobel Prize winners. So anyway, it, this, it, this celebration is not connected to the Ig Nobel Prize but I'm just saying about the paper airplanes. So 26 May is the day for you to make paper airplanes and launch it. Come on friends, don't forget these childhood memories and uh, this is just fun. Please do it. 29th May is the composting day. Uh, you know, if you're a gardener, I'm also a kitchen gardener now and I have started home composting too you know so if you haven't started composting I suggest you uh, to start composting it's not that tough you know you can just get earthworms as well as composting starter bacterial pack from uh, the market and you can start composting your kitchen garbage uh, you know it is an excellent manure for you know the garden 30th day is also related to the gardening it's called water a flower day so best reason to water a flower or plant a flower rather so summer time is very good for summer plants and summer flowers so you can plant a flower and water it you know by the way 29th may is something called pink flamingo day so to celebrate pink flamingos this is a picture from mumbai uh, via reddit fantastic picture so you might have seen that uh, you know this flamingos pink flamingos here in india is a migratory birds right so this is a picture from mumbai uh, during this covid 19 lockdown see that the beauty of this picture uh, pristine right it's the pollution levels are really reducing and the migratory birds are also very happy and you know it, it, it gives you an immense happiness to see this kind of pictures isn't it so i really wish this uh, you know i don't want to say lockdown get extended but we really have to change our lifestyle friends we should really learn to respect our mother nature and lead a lifestyle as close to nature as possible we should learn to reduce our carbon footprint opportunities in the coming week dbt star college scheme the deadline is for 15 june if you are a faculty from college you know the government college then you can apply for the dbt star college scheme so that you can get you know the, the grant for your department yet another scheme from dbt is something called har gobind khurana innovative young biotechnologist award or also known as iyba or iba so the deadline is 25th june it's fantastic for young researchers to try it out it, they will pay you uh, i think it's 75000 you have to check out the link is in the description section of this video please check it out the deadline is 25th june and Friedrich Schiller University in Germany, there are a lot of openings for the doctoral and postdoctoral positions in 2020. Uh, and that is also open now. And please check the link if you are interested to go to Germany for the PhD. This is a very good opportunity for you. So that sums up this week's curiosity. To keep updated when the new episode is released, please click the subscribe icon and subscribe to my channel. If you like this video, please click thumbs up. See you again and have a great day.